This is the Cruise Ship Podcast, a raw look at the hospitality industry. Hey, buddy, how are you? Good, how are you? Oh, good. How are you doing? Uh huh. Just heads in the game. I've it's got my attention. Let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, how's your pivot been? Uh, it's been good. Yeah, yeah we're. Just the biggest thing we've got going right now is just uh, getting our staff kind of head head in the game. You know, mm-hmm. there's a lot of a uh, little bit of mental health stuff going on as far as fear and and you know there's in their rabbit hole. So um, I think as we move along here, it'll get better because we'll um, you know get some routine and we're bringing back a few more people than we need. Like we're not cutting them. Like mm-hmm. basically just going to get their back in the groove, get a schedule. Um, we're opening. Gateway's been open uh, since I guess it's been a, a week Tuesday, and then mm-hmm. we opened uh, Cook Street for the weekend, and then we're opening it again when today. So we'll have all three stores kitchens operating today, and then we're looking to do Nanaimo next week, and then Zambri's of course is doing um, doing a bunch of uh, charity meals, and then we're mm-hmm. open Wednesday to Wednesday to Saturday as well. Are you doing just pickup, or are you doing using delivery service as well? Yeah, we set up our own delivery service. So um, it's basically like building a new business from the ground up, trying to figure out mm-hmm. how to do it and set up our system. So we've got it running pretty well now. We can do deliveries through our app, and we're also doing um, pickup. So um, pickup is at Gateway and Cook Street. Um, Cook Street right now is five days a week, but hopefully by next week we'll have the staff to do seven. Nice. And then Gateway has already got the staff to do seven. And then West, Vic West, we're just going to basically just do community work and all their deliveries will come out of Vic West. So we're probably doing about 30 deliveries a day, 40 deliveries a day. So not bad. hopefully, we, yeah, it's not bad. We're going to add some grocery items too. Mm-hmm. Um, beer, wine, coffee. Yeah, we're going to just kind of build our menu a little bit just uh, to give other people another option. So a little bit about what I've been doing. So I've been doing the Post Shift podcast for about 15 months now. Um, But during this, I decided that I wanted to step it up because there's so much information out there on social media and in the world that I wanted to connect with the people who are doing initiatives, business owners, and seeing how they're sort of dealing with it and their struggles and their successes and stuff like that. And I'm doing that mm. every day, Monday to Friday. So, oh, excellent. Yeah, I'm, you. I'm, I'm doing it at least, at least a recording and a live stream every single day. Oh, good so, for you. I think that's awesome. Yeah. So it's, it's been a lot. Um, but I've got a chance to sit down and chat to like Jeff from Able BC, I, Ian Torsiston from the BCRFA. I had him on the show. He's, his episode is up tomorrow. Um, oh, excellent. Yeah, so Trevor Bird was today. I did live stream with him last week. So really, it's just about getting down to the bottom and seeing how operators have have pivoted. And really, I wanted to reach out to you because the the segment you did on um, uh, CTV um, mm. hit it, it hit me pretty hard because for me, I'm sure you get it as well. Um, I've been asked by a lot of people about what's going to happen in the macro and like why did the light at the end of the tunnel and that sort of thing. Um, yeah. And for me, it's very difficult to see that right now. Um, mm. yeah. Yeah, there's so much information out there and it's constantly changing as well. So for yeah. me, I, I, I say it, I'm like, like, listen, I don't know what's going to be like in three months time, but right now I can help you out with some micro stuff within your business and try and maximize every cent that you get come in to keep, try and keep it as much as possible. Yeah, um, exactly, exactly. So, obviously, after that segment, I, I literally I think I reached out to you after I watched that and dropped you a text. And so, really, uh, how about for the listeners at home, um, you sort of introduce yourself and we'll yep. get, kick it off from there. Excellent. I love it. So, take it away. Um name is Kaylin McNeil. I'm uh, founder of Big Wheel Burger and uh, co-owner uh, of Zambri's. And yeah, I've been in the restaurant business 20 years, and uh, we've had Big Wheel Burger now since 20, uh, 2011. It's already been nine, almost 10 years for Big Wheel. Yeah, it's crazy. That's crazy. Time just flies, man. <laughs> like it really does. Yeah, we just had our 20 year anniversary at Zambri's uh, last September, and mm-hmm. it was just like, where'd that time go? And then we're approaching our 10 year anniversary at Big Wheel, and it's like, wow. 
You're getting old. How did you get in the industry to start with? Uh, Jose and I were married. We're still business partners and best friends. Um, and we had a little bit of money saved up and I asked her what she wanted to do. And she said she wanted to open a food business with her brother, Peter Zambri, who is a pretty renowned chef in Vancouver Island. And, uh, that's how it started. That's how Zambri's came to be, um, in 1999. And then I was doing, I had an import business. I was importing products from Asia and selling them to Home Depot and Costco and Walmart and stuff. And then um, I sold that business in 2004, and then we we got into a little bit of real estate development. And then, you know, gradually I just worked my way into the restaurant as, you know, we moved Zambri's from our original location to the atrium building. And then uh, I had this idea of, to do Big Wheel Burger, um, which we sort of started working on in 2008. And then it wasn't until 2010 um, Jeff Hetherington from Pig and I were having mm-hmm. a, a beer and we kind of, you know, he was one of the original, original founders with, with us. And then, uh, he moved on, um, about a year after we started Big Wheel, but Big Wheel came around to 2011, like I said. So with everything that's happened, uh, in the last, uh, four weeks, did you, did you see it happening or coming to happen? Or was it a complete another shock and like a complete side swipe? No, I was ready. Um, I, I have another business, um, in Alberta that, uh, I have to pay attention to the kind of the global, um, environment. And, um, so I keep track on, on what happens and, and the movement. And so we had that shock in the, um, energy and oil prices. Um, so that was kind of like my initial sort of wake up, like, okay, things are changing. And then I was paying a lot of attention in with in Wuhan and China. I've been to China many times. I had an import business before, so I have friends there. And I was just in China last year, as a matter of fact. So I was conscious of it, and I knew based on what was going on in China that it would eventually get here. So I started um, our sort of like COVID plan um, probably in January. Well, and, and so uh, we were a little, a little, quite a bit ahead of it. Um, my girlfriend and I had a trip planned to Ireland. Like we're supposed to be there now. And I was telling her in January that we're probably going to have to cancel it. And she was looking at me like I had three heads. Um, she's in the healthcare industry. So, mm-hmm. um, obviously, you know, uh, she's in tune with, you know, as it's developing, but, yeah, so I was, I felt I was pretty prepared. And I mean, I had to get over the hump of everybody kind of getting on board because I was pretty early mm-hmm. and, um, people were kind of looking at me like I was crazy. But as it developed, we, we had, you know, it's like we got such a great team. My general manager, Yan Prison, who does, he, he manages both Sambri's and Big Will Burger, the, the kind of big picture stuff, macro. And he's just been a beast. He had a pandemic operating plan. You know, when, when we, when we decided to close, cause we were open for the first week or two and then we went to take out, um, for about a week. And then, um, we just, with all the changing information and, and, you know, not knowing what the future looked like, we just shut down, um, closed all our stores, laid off all our staff, primarily as a, as a, as a preventative measure for them. I didn't want to leave them, um, you know, dependent on us for anything. Uh, I wanted to get them on the EI program mm-hmm. early. And then we could just regroup and evaluate. Um, and we immediately just went and built a pandemic operating plan, had it vetted by our microbiologist, um, who did our, um, HACCP, uh, food safety plan. So we've been building a business to grow it. And every step of the way, we always make sure we implement all the proper procedures and, uh, SOPs and processes so that, you know, I imagine us being a, you know, a 50 unit um, operation or a hundred unit operation, how, how, how would they, how would they do it? Mm-hmm. You know, um, versus what, um, um, you know, smaller companies, you know, you don't need to invest that much energy in it, but I just, oh, I dream big. So I always make sure I plan. So you had the Nanaimo store. You said that you were opening the Nanaimo store this week. What, how close is that to completion when this all happened? Um, it was, where were we? There was a, uh, we had a bunch of delays early and that kind of pushed us back. We would have actually been open and running had it gone on schedule. So, um, 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 
Um, sorry. Uh, and <laughs> so just a lot of people messaging me and whatnot. Um, we've got, um, so we, we would have been open. Our schedule opening date was January 15th mm-hmm. and then a bunch of delays. And then it reached a point where it was looking like we wouldn't be able to, um, um, be, uh, open until probably our, ne- our new revised date was, um, beginning of March. Um, but when everything kind of fell apart, um, we basically just put a pause on it and we, we just behind the scenes just managed to get, um, uh, our permitting done and all the actual work done. So it's basically, it's been sitting there, um, finished completely, you know, spotless and polished for the last two weeks. And, oh, wow. you know, we've, the total investment is, you know, above 500,000. So we've got a sizable amount of money sitting there not producing anything. So it's a little strike. We also hired all our team. We hired, you know, 22 mm-hmm. people and we literally had them the week that we were starting to train is when we decided to close down. So we hired them for like two days, and started training and then we had to let them go. So with uh, sort of laying off all your staff and now sort of re- rejigging everything and sort of reopening, have the staff been responsive to coming coming back and working? Yeah, it, it, this is the, the kind of the challenge. Like I just find in this in this crisis, there's these different you know varying degrees of challenges. So you kind of get through one, and then all of a sudden something else unexpected pops up. And I guess it's not too unexpected for me because. Um, yeah, I deal a, a you know a fair amount with. We have some um, uh, projects that we do. We're doing a documentary on homelessness, um, so I've got some you know a mental health sort of um, experience and just understanding how these things can affect that. And when we decided to, when we had our pandemic operating plan, I was keeping all our staff updated and informed on what mm-hmm. our plan was. Um, and when we did it, I sent it out to everybody and said, you know, we're going to be looking to open. And, you know, it was, it was a lot of crickets because people obviously were unsure of what to do and, you know, we're being told to stay at home and, and all that, which is exactly what we should be doing. Um, I take the food supply chain pretty seriously. And I, you know, just from the macro level, uh, restaurants produce, you know, at least half of the food that's consumed in, in the country. So, you know, you take away all the restaurants and, and you're going to have a major supply mm-hmm. chain issue and food supply issue. And you've also got all this food that's sitting in the wholesale, uh, distribution channels that are just basically going to go bad because it all needs to be, um, produced and consumed or sorry, um, manufactured and turned into something that can be consumed. So, um, yeah, so there was, you know, getting people back to work, you know, the build, the building the teams was a lot slower than I, than I thought. Um, and I've had to do a lot of, um, I guess counseling and just, um, you know, talking people off cliffs a little bit, which is understandable. Like, mm-hmm. and we're not making, we, I don't want anybody to come back that's not comfortable. Um, I'm, you know, my approach is, you know, we built a plan and I'm leaning on that plan, um, to keep people safe. And I'm confident in it. So, you know, for me, I'm like, you can't re- remove all risks, but, you know, the steps we're taking reduce significantly reduce the risks to, to our staff and to the public and to all of that. So, um, in the end of the day for the people's mental health and just, you know, the food supply chain, I'm just r- really urging people just to get back in. And the other reality of it is, is that, you know, I'm anticipating half the restaurants not reopening mm-hmm. in the city. So, you know, when the, when the government funding ends up stopping, there's going to be a, a, a influx of, of restaurant workers that are looking for work. And I don't want my team to be, you know, sitting there relying on the government funds. Um, and when that dries up, not having a job. Well, that's a good point. Like, wh- how, what's your uh, opinion on how much the government's done provincially and federally for the, the hospitality industry? Um, I was a little critical at first. I did um, that uh, Chuck News interview. I first the Douglas Magazine uh, interviewed a bunch of business people about their opinions and stuff, and then I got interviewed, um, and they they pre-recorded it. So it was a Thursday, and then on the Friday, so I called the government out on a bunch of stuff, and then on the Friday they announced <laughs> yeah. some of the stuff. So I was like, you know, feeling like a genius, but <laughs> so I was really. They had to cut some of the interview because I, you know, they had already implemented some of the stuff or, or announced it. Mm-hmm. So, uh, I think I, I'm going to call it a lukewarm. Um, 
I think that the issue is it's one thing to say something and you're going to do it. And then it's like, well, how's that going to happen? And how quick can it happen? You've got a bunch of businesses like mine included, um, that could easily slide into unrecoverable. Um, if the, if we don't get the support quickly, mm-hmm. um, you know, I'm encouraged with our sales volume, um, opening and doing the delivery and stuff, uh, you know, whether we can make money cause we're also paying our employees more because of the risk. Um, we've in, in, instituted a, an auto gratuity as well. So there's, you know, we're trying to stabilize the financial end of it. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's, it's, you know, I, in fact, today I just looked at our bank accounts and we had money come in from the government. I have no idea what it was for. Um, just said government of Canada and, <laughs> you know, it was money in our account. I was just like, oh, like I have no idea why. Like I don't, like we haven't had a chance or an opportunity to apply for anything yet. So it might be a GSC credit or might be mm-hmm. some sort of fund. I, I don't know. But um, so that that was encouraging. Um, we applied through the BDC for some of the funding. Um, I got a little bit of creative. We invested because of our Nanaimo uh, project and some of our IT upgrades. Like we did our, our app and we've upgraded our website and mm-hmm. um, all these things. Um, we pre-qualified for an IT loan. So I remember them sending me an email like three or four months ago, and I just sort of forgot about it. And I'm like, hey, wait a minute. If we've got this loan, maybe I could wrap in all of our years, you know, IT stuff, which mm-hmm. ended up being around 50 grand. So we're getting a loan from the BDC for that. And then we also applied for a cash flow loan. Um, and it, it's just a long process. And part of the problem is, is the administration work that they have to do, which is understandable. But when they're expecting solid businesses, um, to, to spend the time, like we're worried, of, I'm worried about getting people back to work and, and also recreating our, our business so that we can be profitable and deliver it safely. And now they're asking me to do business plans, cash flows, mm-hmm. um, financial statements, um, credit checks. And I'm, I'm like, okay, you're literally going to slow this up by about three weeks. And that puts us at risk further. So I'm just imagining uh, people that, you know, I have an up-to-date business plan all the time. I do cash flows. I have access to a CFO um, mm-hmm. all the time. So I'm fortunate, but a few other people, if you're just a single unit operator and you don't do that, then and you have a viable business, but all of a sudden now it's, it's gone because they can't wait three weeks or a month. Mm-hmm. Um and that's just the, you know, so the, I think the ideas that they've come up with is good. I think it's well rounded. Uh, the execution and how that money's getting out is the problem. Um, how do you think the industry is going to look after all this? I know this is, this can be like, we're, we're always trying to find a silver lining and hope that everybody's mm-hmm. going to come out of this like happy and, and existing still. How do you think this is going to change the industry as a whole in Victoria and in, You've got enough businesses everywhere you sort of can see across Canada, but how's it going to change it all? Uh, I think the restaurant industry will will look completely different. Um, I probably expect 50% at least to not open again. Um, so, I mean, in that, you know, obviously there's going to be a surplus of labor um, and there's going to be a bunch of uh, landlords that have empty spaces um, so there will come an opportunity to perhaps, you know, redefine how it looks. Um, there'll be, you know, leases, prices, leases will go down. Uh, we've always had a, a labor issue for the last three or four years. So that will alleviate, um, the companies or businesses that can pivot, um, like we're doing, um, our price point is a little bit recession proof. Um, the finer dining restaurants, we have that with Zambri's and mm-hmm. I'm not sure what that's going to look like. Um, and frankly, people that want to support and want the restaurant to exist in the new world need to come out and sort of support it. So it's there. And we're seeing that all over. Our brands are being supported very well um, through the fundraising and all that. So I think there'll, there's going to be winners and losers, unfortunately. Um, what I'm advising people that ask is just take a really good hard look on how viable your business model, uh, is in the new world because mm-hmm. you incurring any more debt and, you know, all that will again, it'll affect mental health and it'll also, you know, affect your, your ability to get out of it. Um, so I, I would caution people just to really take a critical hard look at what they're going to do. Um, which is scary. It's sad. I mean, I'm an entrepreneur and I support, 
you know, people going out and starting their own business and all this. And, you know, just the reality that, you know, a whole slew of them aren't going to make it. And not just in the restaurant industry, but other industries as well. It's, mm-hmm. it's heartbreaking. Yeah. So we're talking about uh, landlords, uh, being a multi-unit, uh, a multi-unit operator, you obviously have multiple landlords. How's the general consensus been between landlord to landlord? Because I think you get the a bird's eye view of how different landlords behave. It's it's <laughs> it's one of the most rewarding things about this this whole pandemic is is just seeing the landlords that have come to the table. Um, I'm the type of I'm not going to hold back and calling out um, what I call bad actors in this. Mm-hmm. Everybody's got to share in this um, because a lot of the, the the funding and a lot of this is debt based, um, and the the line of sight on what is going to be forgiven or not forgiven is unclear. Um, basically, what it ends up doing is it trickles down to the bottom people, it triples tri- to the workers, uh, to the small business. They're the ones that are going to end up paying the bill for mm-hmm. for COVID to a large degree. There'll be some big corporations that'll be affected as well, but it ends up coming down. So, I um, you know, it's it's going to be a real, 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 real challenge. But the landlords that we've got, just to give you an example. Um, we're very fortunate across the spectrum. Um, we've got one location that's, um, owned by, you know, uh, uh, an older gentleman. Um, I haven't asked for any rent relief from him. Um, I kind of understand his situation. He's a very good friend of mine. I go for coffee with him every couple of weeks. So I'm picking and choosing who I'm leaning on based on what their economic situation is. And, you know, we've got the, the jaws in our Zambri's building mm-hmm. and they've just been incredible. Um, I had a bunch in our Nanaimo spot, just being brutally honest, I had a bunch of early problems with the landlord group there um, and just creating some unnecessary stresses. And I was, you know, a little bit worried about how they were going to handle it. And they basically put back our con- commencement date to July. Oh, well, effectively, we were supposed to pay rent March 1st. Mm-hmm. We now, we don't have to pay rent or anything until July 1st. And that is like, so on one hand, I'm having troubles with them, or I thought I was having troubles with them. And then they just came through with like a package that is unbelievable. And every one of them has have, have done significant. I had another um, landlord that initially... Um, came out like uh, just bizarrely, but I guess they were dealing with their own pressures too. So, um, he ended up coming to the table, which, which helped. And, you know, I'm not going to be afraid to call people that aren't, aren't, you know, helping. Um, mm-hmm. there's always limits to it, but once we get our, our, our stuff together and we get operational and cash flowing, I'm going to make sure that we pay our rent. If we're able to mm-hmm. pay our rent, pay it. If we're able to get people off EI, going to do it. Like we have a uh, responsibility to, you know, to our entire community to give the aid and the funds to the people that actually really need it. So I'm going to do my part to make sure that we we support everybody. And if that means, you know, not making a profit on stuff and doing it just or just you know break even cash flow, if that helps the community, then I'm all about that. Well, I really want to thank you for your time, man. I know that you're insanely busy and you've basically, you, were you, were you sort of stepping, not necessarily back from operations, but were you sort of watching from afar the operations of Big Wheel? And now you're, from what I see, you're just basically plugged straight back into it as if it was day one of Book Street. Yeah, I mean, my role is sort of big picture. So I deal with the the expansion and leasing and, you know, operationally, I, you know, just a global overview. Um, the Our management teams and, and all the restaurant kind of run the day-to-day. Um, now, obviously, all hands on deck. So I'm d- delivering, I'm in the kitchen, I'm organizing systems and just giving, supporting our management team. And... Um, yeah, so I'll be doing that indefinitely, and hopefully, I think in the next two weeks, I'll be able to go back up to the bigger picture. We're doing a ton of community work, so we have a foundation as well, so I'm really, really focused on trying to raise as much money for, for food, uh, you know, at-risk populations to make sure that they get meals, in particular the front care workers, 
you know, ambulance, a hospital, mm-hmm. uh, fire, um, and then the homeless camps. I mean, these people, you know, if you think about it, you know, like when everybody's at home, you know, people rely on, on cash donations and, and giving and they don't have any of that. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, so it, I'm, that's kind of what I'll be turning my focus to once we get all the businesses up and then just keeping an eye on, on, you know, the developments. I mean, I anticipate, I'm planning this to be at least a year. Um, I don't think it's going to be any sooner than that. Um, so I'm basically preparing and planning for the long haul with this and um, making all my decisions based on that. And I think that will be, if it's shorter, great, but I'll be ready if it's, even if it's two years, like we'll, we'll be ready. What's the name of the foundation? Uh, it's Big Wheel Community Foundation. I'll make sure I link that up. Yeah, and we do, um, people have been donating, like we have a link on our app to donate, um, and we're doing a lot of matching as well. So if people donate, we're, we'll figure out where the need is for food, and we'll, we'll if they've donated $100, we'll, mat- we'll match it to $200. Um, we've had some, you know, fairly decent sized, uh, donations. Um, and we had money in our, we, we take a percentage of our profits each month and put it into, uh, our foundation ourselves. So we, we've supported charities over the last couple of years. Um, but now our focus is just entirely on, uh, on food and, and helping people get food. And we're also, I was one of the founders of Fed, the food eco district, and we're doing, uh, 500, uh, community gardens. That's our goal. So we're going to be planting and providing um, resources for people to plant their own garden uh, in their back for for edible, um, healthy food. So it's yeah, these are all things that I'm pretty passionate about. So I think as soon as the operations get stabilized, I'll go back into doing that and um, just you know see what I can do for the community. Thank you again for your time. You're an amazing entrepreneur and philanthropist. I really appreciate you taking half hour out of your schedule to have a chat. Anytime. The information is power right now. So anything I can do, if anybody wants to re- reach out for advice or any of that, I'll, you know, it's my duty to, to make time to, to help. So, um, yeah, there's no problem at all. Anytime, Sean. I appreciate what you're doing. And I think these podcasts are fantastic. Thanks a lot, man. I'll catch you really soon. Yeah. Excellent. Cheers. Thanks, Be safe, buddy. You too, buddy. Bye. Yes. Bye. Thanks for listening, Pose Shifters. I well, hope you enjoyed that episode. I really enjoy sitting down with friends and peers and uh, just chatting about the industry and getting down to the nuts and bolts of what's really going on out there. Uh, make sure you like, subscribe, comment, everything on all the platforms. Just hit it up and I'll do my best to answer any queries or questions you have. I'll see you next week, guys. Bye.